Welcome back to The Interior Life. I'm your host, Kim Brown, and today we're going to be talking about the Catholic Charismatic Renewal Movement and how the charismatic spirituality can help you grow in your spiritual life. My guest today is Sister Rita from the Disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. She was born in India. She received her bachelor's degree in commerce with a major in accounting from the University of Mumbai. After a life-changing experience of God in her life when she was 19 years old, she became fully involved in the Catholic Charismatic Renewal Movement in India. She joined a youth group in the city that met regularly and did outreaches with the explicit purpose of proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and inviting people back to the Lord and to his church. Her vocation to religious life was born out of this experience and her passion to give her whole life in service to the Lord. In 1985, by God's divine providence, she connected with the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. The disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ are a religious community located in Texas up in our panhandle. Uh, they are a, a Franciscan charismatic re religious community and uh, Sister Rita left everything to follow him. Since then, she's been sent on her community to mission in numerous cities. Uh, in various countries, uh, countries such as Tanzania, Kenya, as well as in Mexico and here in the United States. Uh, she was elected to serve as a, on the general counselor of her council of her community, as well as she's been the mission advancement director for 15 years, and she spent six years on mission at the local house in the community in Mexico. She just recently has been reassigned to the house in Mexico after a break of eight months. Sister Rita has a passion for evangelization, inviting people to return to God and to the church. Sister Rita has also, uh, in addition to the religious studies that you do in formation of your religious community, uh, as well as the continuing formation that her community does, uh, she has been certified in spiritual direction, uh, specifically in Ignatian spiritual direction from Franciscan University in Steubenville, as well as uh, she has attended the school in spiritual direction at the Cynical of Divine Province with the Marian Servants in Clearwater, Florida. Uh, the spiritual direction program in Clearwater, Florida is one of the uh, programs that uh, we would recommend. Um, it's also uh, the program that's known for people uh, that might uh, be inclined to the charismatic renewal movement. So we're very excited to have Sister Rita here with us today to talk about the interior life and how the charismatic renewal spirituality can help you grow in your spiritual life. All right, I'm joined now uh, for Interior Life with Sister Rita. How are you doing today, Sister? I'm doing so well. It's so nice to be here on your program or your, your YouTube video. <laughs> Well, we're excited to have you. Uh, so uh, before we get started, I've already kind of done the bio, but can you tell us a little bit about yourself, sister? So those listening kind of get a little feel for who you are. Okay. I was born and raised in um, Mumbai, in India, and, uh, you know, just normal, ordinary home. My family is Catholic, and... Um, um, but, you know, my dad, I don't ever remember him going to church with us, but my mom took us to church regularly, but it wasn't of, uh, you know, she had a strong faith and devotion, but she could never explain the faith to us. So she, we, um, she followed all the practices of going to mass regularly, all the services and all that. And she was a woman of strong faith. And so we, I grew up in that environment in India where everybody went to church on Sunday. You didn't go, if you're missing, they would find out. And you know, it was a cultural thing. And, um, and that was my life. And, you know, I wouldn't say that I dreamed of, in my younger years, of being, uh, having a close relationship with Jesus or anything. In, in, in fact, it was the opposite, right? I, I dreamed of becoming rich, having a big house, a lot of large family and all that. So um, that's how I grew up until one day when the Lord completely changed my life. I had a life-changing experience of the love of God um, in India. Mm -hmm. I think I could say a lot more, but I think I'll... <laughs> and, uh, you know, when we think about, you know, you talk about your mother, you know, she kind of, you know, she did what she was supposed to do. It was one of those, you know, generational things where they didn't really ask questions. They just did it. The challenge with that was then their children would ask the questions and they couldn't answer the questions. And so, you know, a lot of times you did maybe see kids go away or even, you know, we see, you know, where teens or young adults would be pulled away from the faith where somebody would question their faith and they couldn't answer it and then they would be pulled away. So uh, now in 1985, that's when you uh, encounter the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, the community that you uh, entered. Uh, is that when you entered that year or was it a little bit later that you entered the community? Uh 
Oh, I think we might be having a little uh, lag internet time. Uh, sister, I see that you think you're frozen. So sister, as, as I said earlier, we'll hopefully get the internet connection right back up here. Uh, sis, she's a disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, she encountered the community in 1985. Uh, she's going to uh, disconnect and try to reconnect back into the program. Uh, but so she will have now been in religious life for over 30 years. So uh, she's going to have a wealth of information that she brings. The Disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, their community uh, that is based in Texas up in the Panhandle region, for those of you not familiar. I'm currently based at the Christian Renewal Center, which is uh, in the uh, southeast side. Uh, we're just, uh, you know, if you go down to the Gulf of Mexico, we are part of the Galveston Gulf of Mexico. So she's up in the Panhandle area uh, but their mission is all throughout the world uh, she's a disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ so I see sister is reconnecting with us right now so what year did you enter the disciple Lord Jesus Christ community yes I did um, in 1985 okay yes. in 1985 when you met them so so then you uh, have been in religious life uh, I'm doing my math here uh, how, how many years this will be 36 years this 36 year, years so, so out of all the yes. religious, I've had a number that have, are celebrating their jubilee year this year, but you've got them all beat by a decade. Look at that, sister. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, I celebrated 25 years, 30 years, and I'm almost getting to my golden jubilee, right? <laughs> look at that. <laughs> In and a she's, few years. <laughs> she's, she's getting ready for the golden one. Not She's past the silver, so... <laughs> So as you, um, in your bio, I kind of shared that at 19, you had that uh, real conversion experience where you encountered Jesus Christ. And uh, it was through the charismatic renewal movement that you got involved at, at a relatively young age, at age 19. So how did you become associated with the charismatic renewal? Yes. So it is a very interesting way. And I must admit, um, you know, during the time I was 19, I was down, desperate, lots of things happening in the family, my own personal life, sickness. I also had severe asthma. So my, I lived with my godparents and they sent me to this Protestant group that came from the United States to India to evangelize. And they were on this big open ball, ball field. And they were talking about Jesus like, you know, they just had lunch with him. And, you know, like I told you, oh, I never missed any church services. I went to mass regularly and I never had this experience. Like, you know, a friend, the way that we talk to it. And I said, this is not fair. So that's the night I said, I didn't meet these people, but I was like, there were 14,000 people, I think, or more. And I was just one among them uh, listening. So I said to the Lord that night, I said, Lord, it was the first time I made a spontaneous prayer. I always did rope prayers, right? Prayers that were written. So I said, Lord, if what they're saying is true, I want what they got. And this is your last chance, I told him. <laughs> so desperate. And really, you know, God, <laughs> little did I know, you know, God is so faithful. Really, God is so faithful. I went home that night with a joy that I cannot, ex I cannot express in words. It was just God just put a, two things happen, a joy in my heart and a great hunger to read the word of God to read the scriptures. And so, you know, I asked my godmother if she, they had a Bible at home and she didn't even know. She said, I don't know. I think that's a new testament over there. And she pulled it off the shelf. This was late at night and she gave it to me. I just opened random. It was a new testament and I opened to the um, gospel of Matthew chapter six. And I read the whole thing, you know, look at the birds of the air and the grass of the field. They do not uh, work. They do not spin, but God, the heavenly father cares for for them and aren't you much more important than them? And towards the end of that um, passage, the it says, you know, seek first the kingdom of God and his way of holiness and all these things will be added unto you. And those words, you know, it's just in the song, seek ye first the kingdom of God, 100 times in our church, but it never hit me like this is the word of God. You know, we just sang the song and went home. But on that day, it grabbed me that I was doing everything the opposite. I was seeking the things of this world and not the things of God. And I don't know how God has a way of doing these things. I just got so hungry to know more about the Lord. So in that process, I found out that there was a charismatic renewal in the Catholic Church. You know, and then I, I joined the youth group there. And from there, I just felt spiritually, I grew like so fast <laughs> uh, with the the youth group was a wonderful group, very committed to, to the Lord and to, to the faith. And 
we did outreaches like one week we would have formation the following week we would go out and just evangelize in different parishes we would take four days off from work and set up everything invite people we were organized and um, and from there i just um i couldn't have enough of the lord <laughs> i just I fell in love with him i just couldn't mm -hmm. if there was a prayer meeting if there was a bible study if we had to pray with somebody i was there and um so that was out so 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 I just, that's what we did. You know, just uh, invited people to the Lord every way, even at my work. I had a full-time job. I went to college in the evening. Um, so during the lunch break, we would meet together and talk about the Lord, have Bible study. We would pray, uh, you know, all that kind of thing. So that was my introduction to the Catholic. So that was your introduction. Then can you share a little bit about the history of the charismatic renewal movement? Um, obviously, uh, you know, as you and I are recording this, uh, we're, we're getting ready for Pentecost Sunday, uh, but the, some people watching this obviously won't be watching it on that exact day or anything. So um, can you tell us a little bit about the charismatic yeah. renewal and a little bit about the charismatic renewal? Uh -huh. Yes, I'd be so glad. You know, the history, when it comes to the Holy Spirit, I don't think you can box all of can you hear me? <laughs> yes, we can hear you, I think sister. I lost you. <laughs> okay. Okay. So you can back to the Holy Spirit. So the history could be told in so many different ways. But what I can share with you is some key events that happened in the Catholic Church. You know, the charismatic renewal, as we know it, began really powerfully with the Protestant group in the beginning of the last century. But, and that's how the Pentecostal movement began. But really, I would say began in the Catholic Church, we just didn't know it. So in the <laughs> end of the last century, not the, not the 20th, 20th, but the 19th century, towards the end, uh, it, between the years of 1895 and 1903, there was a sister, her name was Blessed Elena Guerra in Italy, and she felt she's a foundress of the Oblate Sisters of the Holy Spirit. So she had this inspiration to write to the Holy Father, who was Pope Leo XIII at the time, and uh, to encourage him to have Catholic, to get the Catholics to have a greater devotion to the Holy Spirit. So she wrote these 12 letters to, to him and from a convent, huh? like a cloister at that time. And so the, the Holy Father in response to this, because I think the Holy Spirit was speaking to him as well. He wrote a document called um, On the Holy Spirit and it was called Divinium Illud Munus, no? Um, and it was a document on the Holy Spirit. And he also called for the whole Catholic Church to start the novena to the Holy Spirit before Pentecost, which we are in right now. So, and then he did something else. He also uh, dedicated the century on January 1st, 1901 to the Holy Spirit. Did you know that? <laughs> you know, I, did, I, did, I did not know that, yeah. sister. Yeah. It's one of the things that people don't know. He dedicated the whole century to the Holy Spirit. and. And there's something that, there is a little um, personal thing about Pope Leo XIII. He had a vision at the beginning, just before he dedicated the century to the Holy Spirit. You know, just like in Job, how the enemy, the voice of the enemy talking to God to give me, you know, Job's life, the whole thing. So he was saying to God, give me 100 years and I would destroy Christianity. This was a vision, private vision of Pope Leo XIII. While he was saying Mass, and the people who were there, they witnessed this. After the vision, he just turned pale. And when he went to the sacristy, later he related what he saw. In response to that, he wrote the prayer to St. Michael and he asked the whole church, Catholic church, to pray it after mass. Now people know that part, yeah. but they didn't know how it came. So the spiritual warfare that we would be going through in the last century. So that was Pope Leo. He did that. While he was dedicating the century to the Holy Spirit, there was a group of Protestants in Topeka, Kansas, of all places, <laughs> who were there saying, Lord, all these miracles happened in the Old Testament, I mean, in the Acts of the Apostles. They healed people, they spoke in tongues, they, they prophesied, they had the gifts of, all sorts of gifts to do the work, you know, the evangelization. And why is it that we have no power? You know, why is it that's not happening to us? So, so they said, we're not leaving this place until we had to get that same power of the Holy Spirit. Pope is dedicating the century to the Holy Spirit and the Spirit falls in power on these people who were open and ready, right? That was the beginning of the Pentecostal movement. I won't go into great detail on that. So we'll fast forward. 
the Pentecostal movement goes very, grows very fast. It was the fastest growing denomination at that time, and even today it is, really. So in 1958 comes, Pope John XXIII is elected, and he was a person, he said, I was a simple person, I just listened to the Holy Spirit. So he, the first thing he did was almost like, almost the first thing was called the Vatican Council II, right? He, and people thought he was crazy. But he said he heard the Holy Spirit, and that's why he did that. And he wrote this beautiful prayer, and the beginning of the prayer said, Lord, renew your wonders in our day as by a new Pentecost. He said, what happened at the first Pentecost? That's what our church needs. And the whole prayer is beautiful, but this was the beginning. Renew your wonders in our day as by a new Pentecost. So Vatican Council, he convened it in 1962, and he died, right? Pope um, Paul VI took over and Vatican Council finished. It was wonderful. The most, I think it was, you know, all the councils are great, but Vatican Council II was amazing, I think, with what it gave the world at the time that it needed it the most. You know, the documents, we are still, we are still uh, learning what, what, what this great council did. So, so that finished in 1965, the Vatican Council closed, two closed. 1967, there was the same thing that happened at Topeka, Kansas with the Protestants at the beginning of the century. This group of students from Duquesne University went to the Ark in the Dove, a retreat center that is in Gibsonia in Pennsylvania. And there they were, one of them said, I need a miracle. Another one said, I need a renewal of my confirmation. Uh, all of them wanted something, but they didn't know what. And some of them said, you know, we're gonna to go to this, it was like a retreat, required retreat. So they go to this retreat center but the, the, the teachers or their professors had already experienced this power of the Holy Spirit through, through the Protestant renewal. And so they gave them some homework to do before coming to the retreat to read the first four chapters of the Acts of the Apostles. And there was another book called Cross and the Switchblade. They did their homework. They came to the retreat center. You know, they, the retreat was going on, talks and everything. Nothing was happening. Saturday night, they said, okay, the pump at the retreat center broke. <laughs> the sister said, you need to go home. You cannot stay here the weekend because we don't have a man to fix it and all this. So they were going to have a birthday party for one of the students and they were going to go home disappointed. But one person from there, David Mangan, he went up to the chapel and he started praying. And he said, Lord, I, you know, he had it out with the Lord. He said, Lord, here we are. We want more of you and what, however he prayed. So right after he finished that, he felt this instinct in him. He went down to, out of the chapel and he went and opened the faucet and the water came gushing out. He saw that as a first sign that God was at work. So he rushed back to the chapel. He said when he went to the chapel, he felt this amazing power. He gives, I cannot describe it. He was down on his face, thanking the Lord for this. Then Patty Mans, she's Patty Mansfield. She was Patty Gallagher at that time. She was the other student. She was trying to gather the people for the birthday party. She went to the chapel. She felt the same experience there. She just sat there and she said, I cannot describe the power of God. And then all these students, they all came, they somehow ended up in the chapel, either by word of mouth or they were led by the Lord. And they were there experiencing the same thing like the first Pentecost, like the disciples sitting in the upper room with Mary in that, you know, waiting for the promise of the Father. They said, we didn't have terminology. We didn't know what was happening. Some of us were laughing. Some of us were crying. Some of us were on our face. We received the gift of prophecy and we didn't know what prophecy was. They give, received the gift of tongues and they just, um, and some of them were getting deep healing that the Lord was just healing wounds. Okay. So that, that, that part, nobody was leading it, right? And so from there, they, they finished like at five in the morning or something all night just like the Lord sovereignly working in these students. They go back to the, um, Patty Mansfield explains it like in Psalm 126, it says when Yahweh brought the captives back from Zion, they were like men who were drunk. So she says, we felt drunk with the Holy Spirit, but we were not drunk, she said. We didn't know what just happened, but in days to come, they would, they would know, right? They go back to their campuses, they could not stop talking about the Lord. I mean, the experience that she relates, I didn't know this when I got baptized in the spirit. Now the terminology is baptized in the spirit. You know, having this encounter, something that awakens inside of you, that like, is a falling in love experience. You know? So she said, they go back to, the, to, the, um, to their campuses. 
and they have these prayer groups, Bible studies, and people are just adding like so fast. From 1967, um, you know, when this event happened, this movement grew so fast and nobody knew what was happening. It was just spreading. So I don't think it ha- it was exclusively there. I feel God was working all over the world because in 1975, without any organization, there is no founder, there is no manual, we don't know what to do. 1975, there were 10,000 leaders who, who assembled in Rome with Pope, Leo, with Pope Paul VI, now Saint Pope Paul VI, right? And at that event, our mother foundress was there. See, our community was born out of this movement, right? She was there and we were not yet approved by the, by the church at that time. We were just beginning, 1972, and what God was showing our mother foundress. So she was there and she said, she said it was so amazing that the Pope, like when the Pope lifted up, you know, the, at the consecration, the host, all 10,000 spontaneously began singing in tongues. She's saying it was like heaven on earth. And this dove, you know, it, it, in Rome, there are many doves. But this one particular dove was just hovering over this whole congregation. So like a symbolically, it was beautiful. At the end of Mass, Pope Paul VI said, this grace is a chance for the church. Right? And so she came home and she shared that with us. And it's documented in many places. But all the popes have said, this is, an, this is an opportunity for the church, for a revival to the church. Father Cantela Mesa said that this is like, um, he said it is like a current, a charge that the Lord gave to the whole church, to the bar, you know, so that we become alive again. And, and that's beautiful. So from there it started. And, you know, people have prayer groups all over the world. So many millions have been um, baptized in the Holy Spirit, you know, received this grace. And to this day it happens. So, and so, oh, sorry, these phone things are horrible. Okay. And so uh, the beautiful, uh, the beautiful grace of the Holy Spirit through the charismatic renewal, I cannot, I cannot say enough how God has worked um, through them. And so now, so our community was born through this, uh, through this grace. And in 1991, we were the first religious community that the church approved, like Rome approved and we were in, um, installed as a religious community. We are Franciscan charismatic religious community. And so our, our charism comes out of this move of the Holy Spirit, you know, Holy Church. Fantastic. And another little detail right now, the International Charismatic Renewal, they, they bought that, that retreat center in Gibsonia, Pennsylvania. So Father Cantala Mesa, you know him, right? Now he's yes. Cardinal Cantala Mesa. <laughs> He, he says like, we, could not, we could not buy the first cynical, the first Pentecost. So let's do this one. Let's buy it. So they bought it, and our sisters are now administrating it in there. Well, fantastic! Isn't that amazing? Now, 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 when it comes to the when it comes to the charismatic remove, uh, Renault, I think a lot of um, people uh, either they don't know information or. From, from, from what they've been brought up with, they're like, wait a second, you know, they, they, there's a little standoffish. And so sometimes there's terms or things that they might not know. So, so multiple times there, you reference baptized in the Holy Spirit. Can you talk a little bit about what that is, sister? Because yeah. people are like, wait a second, as Catholics, we're only baptized one time. It's a sacrament. What is she talking about a second baptism? So can you talk a little <laughs> bit about what baptized in the Holy yes. Spirit means? Yes. The baptized in the Holy Spirit is just a term that, that they the charismatic renewal used to explain this encounter. You know, so this, this charismatic encounter with, where um, I would say like it's an encounter that something within you just awakens. It's supposed to happen in the sacraments, really. You know, so, and for some people, they do experience it at confirmation. You know, this new encounter, like you just experience God in such a personal way. You just know for, for sure that this is Jesus, right? So what, we, what has happened over time, they have developed a series of teachings like God's love, salvation, new life, you know, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So it's called the Life in the Spirit Seminar. And one of the, at the end of the Life in the Spirit Seminar, the, they, pray the, they pray over all the participants to receive this new grace, you know, that I'm all renewal of your baptism, a renewal of confirmation, a sacrament of confirmation. And that encounter that people have, that new life, and it's not always emotional for many people it is emotional you know at that moment but it is also quiet quiet the fruit of it is like you see this hunger for god you see a joy that you cannot quench you know and it has been misunderstood many times 
but it is something that is, it, it was normal in the first eight centuries of the church. Then we became very formalized and then, you know, we needed something and God gave it. So, you know, it is a work of God, it's a work of the Holy Spirit. So it's hard to, hard to put in words, you know, people all around the world, when you meet a person who is on fire, it's like it ignites a fire inside of you. Um, which is supposed to happen in sacraments, really. If you prepare yourself, you're well disposed, it will happen. Well, I think that's a key. You know, are you well disposed? Do you prepare yourself? Because, you know, I think with confirmation, uh, so many people, it's kind of like a graduation is how they approach it. And they think, well, I'm just going to go through the motions. Uh, but they don't actually, you know, prepare themselves. They're not well disposed. Um, I once heard, uh, and I, I love this, and I use it all the time now when I give confirmation retreats. Um, and it was actually uh, the Bishop of St. Louis. I once had a chance to hear him a couple decades ago, I guess. And he was talking about confirmation. And what he said was uh, to the students, he said, pretty much think of it, uh, your confirmation like a credit card. And you're like, wait a second, don't, don't cheapen the sacraments. But he said, when a credit card comes in the mail, before you can go out and use that credit card, you have to activate that credit card. And so, uh, so, so people understand the concept of you get a credit card, you get a credit card in the mail. And when you get that credit card in the mail, what you have to do is you have to call it in to activate it. And so what I see with the, when we talk about the baptized in the Holy Spirit, when we talk about the life in the spirit seminars, there's these opportunities to activate the Holy Spirit in our life, because I think many of us kind of went through the motions. Uh, but as you said, we weren't well yeah. prepared. We, we weren't like Holy Spirit rained down upon me. Um, here I am a Catholic in the state of Texas. Um, I give parish yeah. missions and retreats. Um, I have a book that I wrote in English and, and it was translated in Spanish. And so people often think that I can speak Spanish and I've had five years of Spanish and I'm like, habla un poco. So I, I, I ask, cause, cause I would love at some point that the Holy Spirit gives me the ability of tongues so that I can give a mission in both English and Spanish, because I know I talk too fast for a Spanish interpreter to have to repeat me whenever I've done that before. And so, but you look at Pentecost and you see where Peter was able mm -hmm. to stand up and proclaim and he's speaking and every single person is hearing in their own language. They're, they're being cut to the heart through the Holy Spirit. So I definitely think that's something that, you know, uh, there, there, there is this need for this revival, this need to allow the Holy Spirit. I often joke, you know, I tell people, you know, when you think God, who do you think of? And most people brought up Catholic will say, well, when I think God, I think the first person of the Trinity, God, the father. And most Protestants will say, well, I think of Jesus mm -hmm. Christ, my, my, my best friend and my savior. And then it's like the Holy Spirit. Who's thinking of the Holy yeah. Spirit? Because that's who's given to us at our baptism. That's who guiding us and being with us. And, and, and so I think a lot of us haven't activated the Holy Spirit Amen. in our <laughs> lifetime. So, so I definitely think that's something that we can see is yeah. the, the fruit and the goodness of it. Um, so sometimes, though, once again, so the life in the spirit seminars, uh, would you say this is pretty much the standard in the Catholic Church as far as, I don't know my good terminology that I want to use here, but, but an introduction to the charismatic renewal and allowing the Holy Spirit to work in your life, would you call that a good introduction through the life in the spirit seminars? I would say so. Yes, absolutely. The life in the spirit seminar gives the very basic teachings that we're supposed to all know, right? God's love. You know what, if you don't know that you're loved by God, and so many people don't, they think they have to earn heaven. You know? okay. It's God's love that God loves you. That's mm -hmm. the first basic teachings. And all the teachings are very basic. And that's a good introduction and openness. So we also pray for healing. People are wounded in every way today, you know, emotionally, spiritually. Just the society doesn't support the spiritual life. And so, the, so there are sessions of healing and, you know, allowing God to do that reserve but the teachings the life in the spirit seminar is also like the basic it's a kerygma it's a basic proclamation of the gospel right and people need to hear that proclamation mm -hmm. and know that god loves them okay. and, uh, and so yes i would say that is a very good introduction to the charismatic renewal well, well and i love that you bring but up it's the... not necessary no no go ahead sister go ahead. yeah i said it's not necessary for you to have this encounter only with the life in the spirit seminar yes. it's not limited god the holy spirit works where he wills yes. and i've seen amazing things happen you know if he worked with cornelius 
who was deep into it. No one is saying, if he poured the Holy Spirit on them and Peter said, you know, who are we to stop them, right? But this is like how, you know, like the sacraments are the ordinary ways to salvation, yeah. but God works in extraordinary ways. You know, so Life in the Spirit Seminar is like an ordinary way to be introduced to the charismatic renewal and what God did in these days. But it's not an exclusive movement by any ways. It is like, it ignites this fire that if you are a Eucharistic minister, you're, you will be a Eucharistic minister on fire. If you are a Legion of Mary, you will be a Legion of Mary on fire. If, if you are in marriage encounter, you will be a marriage encounter on fire. So it is like a place where you come to get that fire that's already in you through your baptism and confirmation through the sacraments that it will be just ignited into a bonfire. I, that's what I feel, you know? And so I know many of my, uh, my uh, colleagues who have gone, and if, who are like in lead in positions of um, leadership because that fire is burning inside of them. Yeah. So there's two things I'll kind of tag team on what you just said. So one, sometimes we hear this term cafeteria Catholic and, and, and when we usually use that term, it's meant in a negative sense, in the sense that, well, I'm going to believe in this, but I'm not going to believe in this. And as Catholics, we don't get to pick and choose what dogmas we want to accept or not. Um, so, but, but, but what I do like about Catholic spirituality for the laity is we can take from different forms of spirituality. So as you're saying, you know, the charismatic renewal is going to make you a better Legion of Mary. The charismatic renewal is going to make you uh, an extraordinary minister of Holy Communion on fire, right? And uh, so when we think about this, you know, exactly. we're, we're doing these interior life sessions where we're learning about different forms of spirituality. And in that sense, I do kind of get to be a cafeteria and pick, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to implement the Benedictine rule of my life so that I can focus on, you know, uh, how do I have different times of the day that I pray, but then I'm also going to take this from over here from this form of spirituality. And so in that sense, we have a, we have a great benefit to our disposal of all these different forms of spirituality and how they can help us to grow. Uh, in union with God, our ultimate goal is holiness, you know, in union with God. And, and how do we achieve that through these different forms that can help us and to grow us and to allow the Holy Spirit to really lead us and guide us uh, who Jesus Christ promised for us. So when I think about that, I just see uh, this ability that you and I have that we can truly kind of pick what forms of spirituality do we want to implement into our prayer life? And so if we haven't ever done a Life in the Spirit seminar, there's this invitation and opportunity. Life in the Spirit seminars, uh, they're done in a variety of ways. You can go to a retreat center such as, you know, the Christian Renewal Center or a Charismatic Renewal Center near you. They're also hosted at parishes. Um, and so you can attend a Life in the Spirit seminar to allow yourself to be open, to be exposed, to receiving the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and to allow the Holy Spirit to lead you in your life. You know, one of the images that I use a lot with youth is the Holy Spirit at your baptism came in upon you. And the image we often think of with the Holy Spirit is a dove. And that dove has free reign to work in your life. But then we start sinning. It's like we throw mud on the dove and, you know, we do this little sin as a kid, but then we get bigger. And as adults, our sins become worse. And that mud hardens and that Holy Spirit maybe is not able to work in your life because now that sin is preventing it. And so when I think about the gift of confession, it's like a big fire hose comes on, washes off all that mud. And now the Holy Spirit has free reign. And that's where we have to learn to hear the Holy Spirit, like we've talked about in a lot of these episodes, so that we can allow the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us. And, and we do want that activation of the Holy Spirit. Now, sister, you also brought up about the healing and yes. giving spiritual direction. I don't think I've ever encountered anyone in spiritual direction that did not need healing of some level. Often I'll say either it's healing from something that was done to us or it's healing for something we did to ourselves, our self-inflicted wounds. So, yeah. so healing is definitely, um, sometimes, and once again, sometimes people hear of healing retreats and they're like, ah, oh, nah, but like somehow they're scared of it because yeah. in some ways maybe we're afraid of opening up our wounds, but like, Jesus Christ is a master physician. He desires to heal us. So, so can you talk a little bit about maybe the healing ministry within the charismatic renewal and what that looks like maybe? Yes. Yes. And so the charismatic, uh, if you, there were one of the things is the spirituality, the charismatic spirituality, it's really the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And one of the gifts, so we have two sets of gifts. One is like in Isaiah chapter 11, holiness gifts. And we learn about it confirmation before confirmation is for ourselves to grow in holiness. No, all the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives us. The second set of gifts is in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 
but it's called the charismatic gifts. So they're the charisms that God gives us to serve the body of Christ. No? So among those gifts, one of the gifts is healing, the gift of healing. So praying for people that God would heal the wounds. We cannot go into the past. None of us can, especially those emotional wounds that are buried under there. Yeah. Think of a woman who has had abortion, how much is suffering inside. But God, you pray over that person and ask the Holy Spirit to go back into that place and bring healing to that. He does it. That wound that is festering for years and years and years, and you don't know how to get there. You know it hurts, but you cannot touch it. Huh? And so that's um, so we pray for healing for all kinds of people, people wounded, people right now. There's so many people suffering because of COVID. There are wounds in there that the loved ones have gone away. We just lay hands on them, somewhere. and it's the love that we also show to our neighbor, right? Being there for them, consoling them, but also, but more important than my love is the love that God has for that person. So praying and asking God's love to touch them, to touch the wounds in their hearts, you know, makes them whole. But there's so many dimensions. There is the healing of, um, the, there are physical healings God does, you know, once he does all those other things. There's emotional healing, spiritual healing. There's deliverance sometimes. And deliverance is not, it's not exorcism. Deliverance is just oppression by the enemy. Some people just open themselves to, horoscopes or all kinds of superstitions or things and they, it's like an entryway for the enemy in their lives you know and then there's there's kind of an oppression so you can pray you can do self-deliverance i can pray i can deliver myself if i have you know feel exposed to something i can do it just renouncing the things that i may have done right in the name of Jesus, by the power of his precious blood. So that, that has like spread in different ways. I, I mean, when you go to healing seminars, you know, they've had it in different places. Yeah, there's so much that um, God wants to heal the person so that they can live that full, abundant life that he came to give us. You know, that they can share that love with others. But I have to be healed and, and receive that healing from God. Yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> well, well, and, well, and when you see the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you know, um, obviously they're there for ourselves for the healing, but they're really there for the universal church for the world. Um, yes. and, and it's pretty incredible uh, when you do have that opportunity. So um, I would encourage people, you know, um, authentic, uh, charismatic renewal is not going to be anything contrary to the teachings of the church, you know. Um, and so, so there shouldn't be a fear of allowing yourself to be open to receiving the gifts of the Holy Spirit, to be open uh, to joining a prayer group um, and seeing what God might have in store for you. Um, I know for my own self, uh, one of the parishes uh, that I was uh, kind of active in once, um, they were going to break, they had a, a gentleman coming that was, um, uh, he was kind of known as, you know, uh, uh, for his healing and prophecy. And, uh, you know, so I went with my parents and I remember, you know, when he came to me to pray over me, uh, which at that point I hadn't really had a ton of people pray over me. Uh, mm -hmm. he prayed over me and then he said a couple things and, uh, he, it was going so fast that they even had somebody there to write down. Cause they knew sometimes you don't remember everything that's said to you. And, uh, so, so they write something down and, you know, he tells me to pray this novena, you know, for this many days. And so, you know, I leave there with my card and I do it and I don't really think about it, but he specifically told me to pray about writing and I, I don't think about it, but I had that card. I did the novena. I put it in my Bible and six months later is whenever my book was completed. And I didn't even know that the time that I was writing a book until I'm like, I think I just wrote a book. And like, and then, and then I remember going back to my card and like pulling it out. Like he told me I was going to do that, which that was nowhere on my radar. Um, you know, but, but it, it's really remarkable sometimes, but you know, I, I will say, you know, I kind of went initially a little like hesitant uh, because yeah. I, I just, I wasn't brought up in the charismatic and the Catholic church. Yeah. And, 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 you know, it was like, it's new, it's different. Uh, but new and different doesn't mean uh, be afraid, you know, and uh, if anything, you know, we hear in the scriptures, be not afraid, you know, so. Be not um, afraid, and yeah, and the Holy Spirit does whatever he wills, you know, <laughs> this is what he did, and so, you know, recently we have been watching together the, the whole series on the chosen, Yes, and it's amazing, it's yeah. amazing, it's so charismatic in some sense, spontaneous, <laughs> spontaneity, you don't know where Jesus is going to go next, and you know, how the spirit is going to lead yeah. him to the apostles. So you have to be ready always. You, you, get, you, you want to be open and willing to go with wherever the Lord leads you. So uh, sister, yeah. um, what would yeah. be some, uh, would you recommend any useful teachings or practices? So let's say somebody's like, I'm kind of interested in the charismatic renewal. Maybe my parish yeah. isn't offering something. 
Uh, is yeah. there a book or is there a, a, a website or something that you would recommend that people could look towards uh, to maybe, you know, expose themselves to the charismatic renewal and the spirituality and the fruits that can come forth from that? We've already said the Life in the Spirit seminars. Yes, Life in the Spirit seminars. You could go to, um, there's a book written by Patty Mansfield. I don't have it here. And it's called As by a New Pentecost. And she has written a, pretty much everything you would need to know. You know, having that book, and it's revised recently. So, uh, you know, I was telling about Sister Elena Guerra and all that. She's written that, that story of um, Blessed Elena Guerra. And they're waiting for her to become a saint now. So that's a wonderful book to get, to get acquainted with what God, the Holy Spirit, has been doing you know, in all this time. Um, they can always go to the Ark in the Dove Retreat Center. They always have programs there. Right now, Patty Mansfield, she's, now she's in her 70s, but she's doing a Life in the Spirit seminar every week. I think they're just finishing on Pentecost to the last. Um, and we have been attending it. So beautiful. Like it was such a renewal for us. But the Ark in the Dove Retreat Center, we have our sisters there. And they have programs for Pentecost. They're having a big thing if they go online. And they look at, they can join online and they can join in person there to be more acquainted with what God is doing. Very good. Um, I would say that. I mean, our community here, we do retreats for, you know, they can contact us, disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we have a website. Um, you could go there. And there are many books written. Renewal Ministries is a ministry that sends uh, missionaries to different countries. Um, and, and they have also lots of resources. Beautiful, wonderful teachings by Ralph Martin. Do you know him? Yes, he's fantastic. Yeah, he's fantastic. And I went myself on missions with the Renewal Ministries. Seven times I went to Africa, to Tanzania. And the experience, you know, I wouldn't exchange it for anything to, to proclaim the good news to people there. And there are lots, there are lots of resources, really. <laughs> you know, Caris is the international office in Rome. They also have resources if you just put C H A R I S. It's all the renewal movements are now under one umbrella and it's called Caris. Mm -hmm. And that was recent that the Holy Father had no separate um, covenant communities, separate charismatic renewal. They <laughs> all one, one group. And, um, and the service, um, the main office is in Rome there. And every country, like we have the National Service Committee, they have also resources on their website. Yeah, but if um, if you want to contact us, we can get more. Uh, even on our website, I think there are some links that we have um, of different resources. Fantastic. Uh, so, so, there, so there's definitely quite a bit out there with the charismatic renewal. And as you're talking, probably most people watching this, I mean, here we are in the year 2021. So everybody that's 22 years and older, you are literally a Holy Spirit baby since you were born in the century of the Holy Spirit. So um, we, we need to definitely, I think, invite the Holy Spirit more into our life, into our church, into our ministries. Um, yeah. You know, I know the come Holy Spirit prayer has become, you know, much more popular and just that, that time of, you know, when you go to prayer, just to silence yourself before you even start the prayer and just invite Amen. the Holy Spirit into that prayer time. Uh, yeah. th there's that opportunity to learn, to listen to the Holy Spirit uh, and then uh, asking the Holy Spirit for the courage to follow him because uh, sometimes yeah. you might know where he wants you to go, but you're a little afraid to do it. So uh, sister, exactly. sister, would you close us out in prayer? Yes, I will. But I want to share just one small thing. Uh, this is my spiritual director, was Father Thomas Dubay, and he wrote these wonderful Oh, he's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, God rest his soul. But he gave me this thing once from Father Pedro Arupe, and you probably know this quote, and it says, fall in love, right? And this quote says, nothing is more practical than finding God, than falling in love in a quite absolute final way. What you are in love with what seizes your imagination will affect everything. It will decide what will get you out of bed in the morning, what you do with your evenings, how you spend your weekends, what you read, whom you know, what breaks your heart, and what amazes you with joy and gratitude. He says, fall in love, stay in love, and it will decide everything. And I would, say, I would summarize that the experience of a charismatic renewal is really an experience of falling in love with God through the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, you, I feel as a charismatic, I'm 100% Eucharistic, 100% Marian, 100% Catholic, 100% religious, 100% of everything. All that we are supposed to be as Catholics. 
And so with that, I would like to end in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this time that we are just before Pentecost, preparing once again for a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon us and all those who will be watching this video. Lord, that you would touch them deeply by the power of your Spirit. Put a hunger and a thirst in their hearts for you, that they would long for you with their, with their whole heart, Lord, and they would come alive, that you would ignite that fire that is already within them, Lord, to be alive, to receive life and life in abundance. And we ask all this through the intercession of Mary, our beloved mother and queen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much, sister. It was a real pleasure talking with you today. Oh, same here. <laughs> I hope it, with all the interruptions that it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was, sister. God bless you. Okay. And God bless you too. Will, I, will you send me a uh,